Hey guys, I've got a special video today. I normally wouldn't put such a long video up here on YouTube, but the truth of the matter is that I have so much content shot with our guest today, Dan Cloutier, that uh, a lot of that is gonna end up on From the Field and I might have more coming up here on YouTube. There's just, there's so much. Dan Cloutier is a, just a wealth of knowledge. And when I went to shoot him, I actually went on two different occasions. Uh, this is part of the first time I went to visit him. He's such a wealth of knowledge that I frankly felt it quite overwhelming. I'm normally, I normally don't feel that way with guests because when I'm visiting farms, particularly vegetable growers, I know so much about what they're doing and how they operate that I know what questions to ask and I kind of know how the video will go. But in this case, Dan just is such a wealth of knowledge that I, I felt somewhat overwhelmed with his operation that I was somewhat awestruck many times with the things he was showing me. The technology on these greenhouse structures that he use, uses are incredible. And in this video, he's gonna give us a tour of this. And this structure he's using is built by a company called Sprung, which was actually where we were. We were at the headquarters of Sprung just outside of Calgary. But Dan operates an enterprise within Sprung which is basically doing R&D for that company. And his company is called ARC. It's the Agro Resilience Kit. And he's trying to set up sort of a greenhouse that could operate in really any kind of climate. And even here we're a, zone, or a USDA Zone 3A. It gets down to minus 40 Celsius and minus 40 Fahrenheit at the coldest months in the winter and uh, he's growing all kinds of crops here. So this is an aquaponics based greenhouse that's growing crops year round. And I think you're really gonna find the technology in these structures fascinating and very intriguing. I'll leave an email below in the show notes if you guys wanna reach out to Dan to learn more about these greenhouses. But I'll just leave it to Dan, enjoy the video. Sprung has been manufacturing and selling these buildings for a very long time. Or all kinds of buildings and the fact is is they knew greenhouse technology had worked because they had operated about 10 acres of commercial greenhouse for a good number of years some extraneous things happened they exited the the, the market they were probably very much ahead of their time and so we had a number of conversations over a period of, of time where what what sprung wanted is we just want to sell structures and what we uh, saw ourselves doing as the agro resilience kit is, hey, you know, we, we want to operate a small greenhouse like this, essentially a development uh, greenhouse. We'll, we we want to operate it commercially and grow food and prove what's possible. So everything that we grow in here, we actually sell commercially. We have a small CSA that we operate oh, no wow. and we operate it uh, year round. Um, and then on, on top of that, we sell food to distributors. So we sell food to the, to the um, Sprung Cafe and, and uh, to a couple of other distributors. So, you know, we, um, we can produce more food here and we'll be slowly maximizing it. But part of the things that we're doing with the kit is showing different components that are possible. So, so one of the big advantages, and I'll, I'll bring you over here, Curtis, is that if, if you try, one of the trends that has emerged is to say, we would like to put a greenhouse on an existing rooftop yeah. of a grocery store, of a hotel, of a, a, of a warehouse. And the fact of the matter is that most structures are far and away too heavy. Now, because this is membrane, as you can see, and very light, and this is aluminum, and the aluminum has a 50-year guarantee, and the membrane has a 10-year uh, guarantee, this structure that you see here is about three pounds per square foot. So I can take a standard structure warehouse or grocery store. Their roofs are generally engineered for 100 pounds per square foot. So if I put this from load-bearing wall, which I can, to load-bearing wall on that building, then what I end up with is I actually haven't used any of that 100-pound weight. 
So now I can just dedicate, a, dedicate the weight to growing. Actual production. Absolutely. That's water's heavy. Yeah, so, so we love grow rafts like this, but they won't go on rooftops. They're just too, too, much, water. too much water and just too heavy. So what we show here is we have these kinds of A-frames and so now I can structurally engineer so this support and the back support go from load-bearing truss to load-bearing truss. Yeah. I'm not getting the density of plants I'm getting with the, the floating raft system. Oh, no? I'm no. surprised. It's a vertical and everything. I, I, you know, depending on what we're growing, we can probably be there. And, and we, we keep playing with stuff that we're growing. Yeah. So, um, you know, for certain crops, gee, this is a, you know, not, we can space this a lot closer. We can space the pipes closer, that kind of stuff. But, so this is, this is 40 by 105, with this, which is one eighth of an acre, right? Yeah. If this was California field, growing romaine or strawberries or whatever, we're going to have a row and then access, yeah. right? Typical stuff. So in an eighth of an acre, averages, depending on crop, about 4,500 plants. So these A-frames, the way we're doing it, we're going to be about 7,500 plants. Not bad, you know. You know um, everything you can do to, for more revenue per square foot, that tends to be the thing for greenhouses, particularly when the field crop, they have the advantage that they don't have energy costs. Right, they, they don't have utility costs to speak of. We clearly have heating and some cooling, which I'll get into, mostly not light costs, right? Now, we do run, just to show people what's feasible and you know what happens, is we have some LED lights and we have some high pressure sodium and that kind of stuff. Because what we like to show is rather than make claims about this or that, we like to try to show people side by side, there's still variables, there's still microclimates, but, but we, we like to show as best we can, did that LED lights improve our production by about 20%? Well, in the winter, it's higher than 20%, but in the summer, why would you even turn them on, right? And that kind of stuff. Yeah. So we... Um, we're, we're constantly working to, to, to show a variety of those things and, 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 and what can people grow. You know, tremendous amount is happening with growing lettuces. That's great. Uh, it's only great though until the, the um, uh, there's a, a saturation at, at certain points. Other thing we don't like about lettuces. We need a market saturation. Yeah. The other, the other thing we worry about and have seen with lettuces is in the winter months, you know, prices are pretty good. 25% of the cost of California lettuce or Mexican lettuce is getting it here. And, and by then it's spent a bunch of time in trucks. We all know that stuff. But in the summer months, we see, well, gee, you know, lettuce crops, uh, we, we, we don't need uh, so much. So we do a number of things. We're showing, this is aquaponics, and we're showing um, a, a type of cauliflower uh, growing. Now it's meant to be a small crown cauliflower because it uses a limited amount of sunlight to get there. Um, most people, if I try to provide them that as a head of cauliflower, they're gonna go, eh, no, that's not it. For the distributors that we sell to, we can sell those colorful cauliflowers to restaurants and it's garnish, right? right? Yeah. And when was the last time you saw a white and purple yeah. uh, cauliflower, right? U unique kind of breed. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the summer months, we can grow a lot of cauliflower in these beds and, and in these racks and we can get to nice full head. And in our market, it's never really saturated with, with cauliflower. Heck, we got 100 frost-free days and it just isn't hot enough uh, for a lot of folks to grow uh, cauliflower. You get a little bit of field ca cauliflower here. And over there you see that's, you know, we, we, we're getting a head start on our broccoli 
uh, production, and, and so now we can, we can uh, maybe transfer and do, and do some of those things. So that's infrastructure examples of things that we do that Sprung says, hey, you, you know, that's not what we offer the customers. But because we grow in the environment, we understand the building, then we can understand, well, I would recommend this way of growing or that yeah. based on various applications. Yeah. But the next thing that we work very, very closely and importantly with Sprung is energy efficiency. As a rule, if you're going to do a greenhouse and your banker's still talking to you when you said you were thinking about it, <laughs> um, you know, what, what do people worry about? Well, if I build a really large greenhouse, I get economy of scale. That's where most of the money is made today. But I got to be next to a really large market. And then I got lots, have to be lots of people. And gee, you know, is there any doubt why a lot of these, uh, this infrastructure is located where you get the cheapest of labor possible? In fact, you know, in some cases, hey, we happen to have this border and we, <laughs> we don't have to pay minimum wage and we don't pay overtime and, you know. Well, we, we, you know, people can do that scale of greenhouse with us, absolutely. But for ARC, we're really, really interested in the small scale greenhouse. In other words, if I'm going to put it on a rooftop, I probably don't have a 20 acre, let alone a 200 acre rooftop. And if I am going to put it on a rooftop and I can't make it affordable and profitable, then that's not going to change our, our food production paradigms. Yeah. So as I say, we're operating an eighth of an acre greenhouse. Our numbers pencil out really nicely. We can have one to two employees and they're you know, relatively well-paid employees. So it can really be that mom and pop operation or whatever. And yes, labor's still going to be their largest cost. Yeah. But if one or two people can manage the enterprise, then perhaps they're not looking to do, a, 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 you know, that yeah. cheap labor hire. They can stay small. They can stay small and, and, and do well. But the second highest cost in greenhousing is always, it doesn't matter if it's a hot climate or a cold climate, it's always utility costs. Yeah. So here's what we've done to, to uh, change those paradigms. And I'll, I'll deal with uh, cold climate first. So as, as we talked a bit about, this is a very airtight uh, construction, right? We, we have scientifically me measured and proven that we have about a 2% air loss. See, unlike other materials, we're not subject to caulking. Caulking has a, you know, a tendency to break down over, you know, say three years or whatever. And then when you take a pressure washer to caulking, what happens, yeah, well, right? It's, it's, not a, it's not a great thing. It's surprising with even relatively little leakage in a greenhouse, a 15 mile per hour wind increase can double your heating cost, right? So air tightness, that's why all greenhouse manufacturers strive for it and brag about it. But this is unparalleled uh, for, for um, that kind of stuff. So that's, that's great. That's, that's why our heating costs are what they are. You know, I had one guy that said, when I gave him some of these stats, he asked, are you located on a volcano? And, and he was basically really challenging this, the stats. No, we're, we're just here in essentially Calgary, Alberta. And if you're in a 2,500 square foot house and you had six days of minus 30, what would your heating be, bill be? if you're uh, paying about $6 a GJ for gas. Well, we're paying about $6 a GJ for gas. Last winter was much colder than this winter. Last winter, our coldest month, we had six days in that month of minus 30. And yet our heating bill in this greenhouse was under $700. That's air tightness. Mm -hmm. It's some of the passive solar stuff that we do. Yeah. It's having 
quite a large volume of water in the building. Yeah. All of these things contribute, right? That's right, right. But um, the other thing is, sorry, the other thing is this uh, thermal curtaining. This go over at night or something? Yes. Uh -huh. so, so very often, you know, what, what people are doing is, uh, is a treatment that isn't flexible by the hours, right? And, 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 and I love everything about permaculture and passive solar greenhouses. But having done what we've done, see, sun is south for us essentially coming through that way. We're not completely oriented south, but mostly right. this long side is south. And so that's your northwest corner, if you, if yeah. you will. So most passive solar guys would have probably insulated yes that whole half or side of the wall. And there would be advantages to that, absolutely. But what you'll see when we walk over there and I show you some of those racks, is you're gonna see that on those racks, if we had done that, half the sides of those racks could not be growing. Of course, there's not enough ambient light coming. Absolutely, in. or spend a lot of capital putting artificial light That's and right. all that yep. kind of stuff. We grow um, kale and Swiss chard and romaine lettuce and mixed lettuce on both sides of those racks all year. And, and when you go over there, you'll see there's little difference wow. in growth. Yeah. But we end up insulating at night by pulling this mylar curtain over, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and we do it by hand. Yeah. I mean, we can automate this, but we pull it across. It doesn't take that long. Like, like that. Um, so a couple of things. What we've ended up doing is we're now we're creating an airspace of about 44 inches between these membranes. You'll also remember, if you're old enough, um, that the early spacesuits, yeah, they look like Goodyear uh, yeah. mascots, right? And then all of a sudden they got a whole lot smaller. That was mylar, right? Not necessarily entirely, but yeah. but a uh, very, very big impact. So space age material that is now very commonly used and, and, and became affordable. So we made it scrimmed uh, for, for tensile strength. Uh, so when we we're pulling this and smacking it and whatever, we're not terribly concerned. Most shade curtaining is very fragile, as an example, or thermal curtain. Yeah. And, and when we did some market research, we heard lots of people say, yeah, I used it for two years. It got hooked here, there, it got torn. Then I had a hole and then, uh, you know, it limited my, my thermal blanketing value. So then I stopped using it. Right. And, and so we, we, we didn't want that. So two, two very advantageous things, a 44 inch air gap dramatically increases our R factor. We say this membrane single is about an R1. We say with the air gap, we haven't done a, a precise calculation with an engineer, but we think maybe it gets us up to about an R3. Um, as you know, with R factors, that's you know, exponentially improved. Um, but perhaps the biggest thing is, is what you can see is we arc it over and we arc it over our Modine heater, right? So in the coldest days, we, we try to do things so we're using passive uh, heating techniques and so forth. And so we try to do it so this Modine heater comes on as little as possible. But what happens, that peak is about 23 feet. But now when I reduce that to be about 10 feet, yeah. I instantaneously, very dramatically, decreased the amount of cubic feet Absolutely. of air that I'm heating. Yeah. And so, you know, it can be a bit of a bother, sunrise, sunset, uh, timing that and pulling it over. But in terms of energy efficiency, it's really uh, quite ex extraordinary. So then, in this air tightness, airtight structure, what did we end up finding out? Well, what we did originally, and uh, you can see some of the some of the remnants of it. Here's a, a frame of a fan that we 
we removed and there is a fan above above there and we had aluminum louvers at the back at the back so what we were able to do was the calculation in theory was we had enough fan capacity to suck the air through the greenhouse and change the air every four minutes right so that would argue well you shouldn't get uh, above ambient and we don't get very many above 30 degree days so we tried that for our first season back into greenhousing say how's that work and the fact is is we um, spent a tremendous amount of even shoulder season especially in the summer overheating constantly with plants in stress yep. bolting packing it in whatever it was so that just showed us what we knew the air tightness of the building just means fantastic very little heating in comparison but what be, was your friend there became a challenge in the, in the next season or seasons. Mm -hmm. So we went to a passive solar approach for cooling. So what happens is that, and um, we just, um, you can take a picture of it. So we do aquaponics here. Okay. We, we do limited number of racks. These two tanks are uh, trout. We just finished selling all of our trout. Um, and so we just have had our first restock. And we can uh, move this perhaps out of the way for you for half a second. So if you, um, if you look in here, what you'll see is oh, yeah. our, our, our fingerlings, our mm -hmm. first batch of fingerlings just arrived. All right, so... Because of that, we don't have this rack planted because there's no, really no nutrients. There. Yeah. yeah. So it gives us an opportunity to show something else or explain something else anyway. So in the summer, we open those zipper screens. And so the cool air comes in from the north yep. and it starts coming in low. And then almost, well, in fact, mechanical principle, just like a chimney, on temperature, those wind turbines, the louver opens and the turbine just starts sucking the hot air out of the greenhouse. Yep. All right, so, so we, at times, in the shoulder months, that'll cool the greenhouse by itself, right? But other times, it, up there in particular, we'll still be hitting 40 degrees, 45 degrees, and down here we'll be getting into problematic areas, yeah. right? Having height is really nice, it is. very Water valuable. Yeah. yeah. But what happens when, when any time uh, our ambient is, it gets over 28, pumps come on, and that black line there, we start uh, basically jetting water misting water, if you will, and it pours onto this clear membrane. Okay. And the interesting thing about this clear membrane is we've done the spectrometer tests to show that it just basically light is all let in, right? It just does not block light. You create sort of a refrigeration effect. That's exactly it. The old school, like the clay pots, this is actually a thousand year old idea. That's very much. But what, what, what we're able to do now is, is rather than a whole lot of solid infrastructure or whatever, we're staying absolutely in our translucent environment. And so we missed up there. And if you're standing here in a nice hot day, you're actually going to feel the cool the air dropping down. just dropping. Because it's pulling the heat from the water, right, as it's evaporating. You, wow, you got I've never seen this in a, were you guys the first one to do this in a greenhouse? I've never seen so, it before. So we don't, you know, we've taken over the patent, but um, we kind of keep some things to ourselves. Right. But it's a very prestigious university that did this work. They designed it, and then they tested it for four years in a, in a commercial greenhouse in Barbados that some guys wanted to do. 
Because see, in Barbados, what the problem was is they don't, they're not able to grow that much food there. Particularly a lot of crops that we're kind of used or like to eat, you know. Sure, they grow mangoes great. Yeah, the hot climates are, are, are harder than people think. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, what, what this commercial greenhouse does is they grow lettuces and cucumbers and all, all, all the things. And for uh, four years, the university, you know, tightened and tweaked and, and tested and measured exactly what happens here. So then last summer, we adapted this with the help of Alberta agriculture to the sprung structure. And so what happens is, and what we, what we measured and proved, is that we will reduce the temperature in this greenhouse. It can be 35 degrees outside. We can be hitting 50 degrees up there. And we can take the temperature of this greenhouse down to 15 and probably 20 degrees C below ambient. Swamp coolers typically cannot go below ambient. And on top of that, um, if you're using conventional electric air conditioning, you can do anything, but my energy consumption energy. just goes right through the roof. This, you're just pumping water. Well, on top of that, um, is very importantly, the water runs down, but it's captured in, in our little eaves trough, and then it goes into a tote, and we pump it round and round. So, we're in a dry climate. You know, in the, in the summer months, ambient humidity might be 30, right, percent. Yeah. Well, the plants would rather 50 percent sure. or what have you. So, what happens is now we're actually creating that um, humidity. We're raising the humidity in the overall greenhouse. We're getting it to a much more optimum grow. But nevertheless, when you measure it, we're using 50 percent less water than a swamp cooler would. And we're only using 5% of the electricity. And on top of it, and it's just um, a, a somewhat a additional beneficial thing, we have somewhat hard water here. It's not crazy hard, but it's somewhat hard. And when you ask most growers, um, what would you like to use, rainwater or tap water? They'll take rainwater. Every time, they always take rainwater. Well, when we started measuring the water as it would go through a number of these cycles. It's not quite, you know, but it, it starts to emulate a certain amount of as if it was rainwater. Because it's, a, it's an ex expedited hydro cycle. Absolutely. So it, it's losing a bit of the hardness, yeah. right? So we use a little bit less acid than because yeah. we, don't, we don't need to, etc. right? Yeah. So we'll leave it at that for now. Tell me what you guys think about these greenhouses and this operation. I will leave the comments enabled on this, so please tell me what you guys think. Do you wanna see more stuff from Dan? What do you think about these greenhouses? What do you think about the operation itself? Let me know, looking forward to hearing from you. Oh, and if you wanna get in touch with Dan, I'll leave an email in the show notes. All right, take care guys.